Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. We are approaching the end of February 2023 and we continue to advance the frontier of architectural thinking through conversations with fascinating and interesting people. And I hope you will agree that that is certainly the case with my two guests today, Arsela Kripa and Stephen Mueller both of whom are principals of a fantastic research and design company called Agency, and who have recently published a book called Fronts, Military Urbanism and the Developing World, which is a fascinating look at some clandestine technologies that are being deployed currently in the United States and their complex relationship, both with the questions of immigration and migration and with the question of uh, the climate emergency. Uh, Arsela and Stephen were here recently to do one of the Space Dot City lectures here in Seattle, and it part of my collaboration with Space Dot City. I am doing this, com- having this conversation with them, which I hope you will enjoy just as much as I did recording it. Here we go. Architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as <coughs> architecture. So hi, Ursula and Stephen. Thanks so much for coming to my office. I'm excited to be doing a recording today in person. It's been a while (laughs) since I've done a recording in person, mostly everything. Zoom has so normalized life that I, I was already doing a lot of my recordings online, but now Zoom has become such an easy default that most people say, "Ah, let's just do it over Zoom. So I'm very glad to have you here in my office to make this recording. Thanks so much also for the fantastic lecture last night with Space Dot City uh, down in our wonderful auditorium designed by OMA in the Seattle Public Library. You did a great lecture on, on, on the work that you do, fronts, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about all your various interpretations of the ideas of fronts and your very engaged work and beautifully presented work. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and, and, and it's provoked so many ideas and thoughts uh, that I want to ask you about. But first, uh, so you are, where are you? You are at, in uh, Texas Tech, uh, down in southern Texas. Uh, where are you guys based and what are you doing? Yes, uh, we are based in El Paso, yeah. uh, which is the westernmost edge of Texas. Yeah. Um, and we, um, I direct the Texas Tech College of Architecture in El Paso, which is just a, sat- a really small satellite program um, and uh, meant to, um, to work with students in the El Paso and Ciudad Juarez region. Okay. Uh, so we have incredibly binational, bicultural, bilingual students. How, how big is your program? We have... This a, satellite program. We have 50 students and eight faculty. 50 students in the entire program? Yes. It's um, a graduate program or undergraduate program? It's an undergraduate program, and we recently also started a, a graduate program in historic preservation as well. Okay. So this is an accredited degree? Or? It's an accredited degree. It's a Bachelor of Science in Architecture. That's good. Yeah. 50 students, 8 faculty, that's a pretty good ratio. It's fantastic. Uh, and our students are third and fourth year students only. Um, we have an agreement with a community college and the idea for us being there is that many of the students in the region um, were finishing their first two years but never moving on because they couldn't leave their families or they yeah, can't yeah. afford to go away. So we started the satellite program um, and the relationship with the community college is so robust that we actually exchange ideas of curriculum and we've built this, this smooth transition um, coordination and so the students that come to us for their third and fourth year then graduate from us. Um, so they graduate with a what? A BA? With, or a, a, with a Bachelor of Science a in Architecture Science. from Texas And Tech, then they yeah. can go on and do, do a an MRC, MRC, yeah. And, 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 and that's fantastic and so uh, kind of uh, outreach is written into the program. Right. 
So you get a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the. That's amazing. Yeah. You can see how this also becomes a amazing research. And and Stephen, you are uh, part of the faculty there. Yes, I'm an associate professor, recently appointed as such, and I'm also the director of a research center that we co-direct called yeah. POST, the Project for Operative Spatial Technologies. I'm the director of research, Ursula is the director of projects there. As director of research for POST, I oversee the research efforts of POST. Basically, it conducts design research in a series of different issues related to social and spatial and environmental justice. Yeah. So it's basically a, a managerial role in the in the research center, and not not a role for the the college at large. Oh, yeah. Okay, within yeah. the research center. But yeah. we we have three research assistants who are our undergraduate students. Okay. And the idea is that we can partner with community organizations or local governance as an entity that provides design and research services. Okay. Um, this this is kind of our way of taking the research out of an academic context and and finding ways that it has impact. So how did you end up in, in, in El Paso? Is this the job, you applied for it and you just went there or did you, is this something that drove you? A bit of that, well we drove ourselves. So we happened upon El Paso during a road trip for another graduate studio that we were teaching. We used to teach at Washington University in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And we were on travel with our students for a, a studio that we called Securocratic Frontiers, where we were basically traveling through energy territories and emerging military territories mm -hmm. related to energy extraction. Mm -hmm. Our final destination was actually a um, location that we write about a great deal in our book, Playas, New Mexico, which was a former copper mining town that's since become a simulated urban environment for urban warfare training. We picked El Paso as the closest spot that we could sort of camp overnight before moving into <laughs> southern New Mexico to mm -hmm. go to Playas for this part of the research. Not really knowing much about El Paso or ex expecting much from it, but we got in touch with Ursula's predecessor, the, the director of the College of Architecture, who introduced us to the school and introduced us to a number of different folks in town during a very short stay, like a 12-hour stay in El Paso. Yeah. Just absolutely fell in love. Especially oh, okay. after after traveling for days through West Texas and and uh, like very very rural sparse environments to just happen upon this this binational metroplex where millions of people sort of share this valley we kind of drove in in the middle of the night and we're just in in absolute wonder we kind had never of a really mini heterotopic space is, is this, yeah. is exactly this how you're describing it. Yeah. Also is very yeah, a bit. It feels very remote, I think, to folks who who have not visited, or even folks who mm -hmm. you know live in other parts of Texas. My my family grew up in more around the urban centers of Texas, and and had a very particular perception of El Paso as being the most remote <laughs> drive-through location in the Southwest. Does you know, El it's Paso not have a sort of a special identity in the Texan imagination? Am I, is that what I'm hearing you say? I, yeah, I think we'd have to ask the other Texans, but yeah, I, oh, I, I believe, you know, Texan. it's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, um, you know, I think it is, it's more aligned, I think, than, than other parts of Texas with the culture and the society of sort of northern Mexico and maybe southern New Mexico. We actually share our energy grid, <laughs> you know, with New Mexico. In we share zone. a time zone with New Mexico. Everybody that lives in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, it's really a joined sort of uh, binational community there. So it doesn't feel Texan as much as it feels locally robust across these kind of three so cultures. So a binational community is sort of a, seems to be a major term in over here. And so how do you read the wall in that context? I saw last, yes, last night you were uh, spent uh, significant time in the first part of your lecture on the wall and of course we can read it via Trump and you know that whole sort of rhetoric but uh, talk to me a bit more locally in terms of how is it simply a scar down the a, a kind of a cross-border identity or how do you theorize it? Well so locally the because it's a binational community, and what that means is that many people have citizenship on, of both nations and live on both sides, depending mm -hmm. on the, the day of the week and, and work-related kind of geographies. But in that sense, the border wall has not really changed the kind of the, the fluid 
movement of people who li have lived in the region for generations, but the attitude that was paired with Trump's border wall and the way in which DHS and Border Patrol have kind of conflated policing of that border, that has become an issue that has really become divisive in the communities. And so crossing and checkpoints have- Divisive in the communities, what do you mean? And so, so whereas crossing and checkpoints continue to be wh what they were, mm -hmm. the controlling and the layers of paperwork that are required to cross over now are just more intense. And so we have artist friends who were doing exhibitions and work on both sides of the border. But if they live in Juarez, during the, the Trump administration, they were being held in Border Patrol rooms for two or three hours at a time without an explanation to mm -hmm. make crossing just really a burden, a burden so that many of the activists we know said, you know what, forget it, I'm not even crossing into U.S. because it'll take forever. So divisive you meant it's just made it difficult for people to cross the border. It's not right. divided the community in El Paso. Right, right. It's it's just like it's a, it's a software tactic on the hardware of the infrastructure that just makes crossing right. really difficult. Got it. But you are interested in the hardware of the wall itself. Right? Yes, yeah. As, a, as an architectural project to a certain extent? I think if it were up to, to me, there would not be a border wall at all. Mm -hmm. I think what we were interested in is this idea of, you know, the triad of architectural production, the faster, cheaper, or better, right? Like one of them has to, has to give up, like how we teach students in sort of project management. And the fact that these patented technologies that are meant to speed up construction and make it cheaper and make it more durable are have a have a way to kind of permeate through the construction industry is what concerns us and so the question of the tools and the intentions of those tools is is really important if we were to boycott them perhaps fisher industries which is one of the the companies that built the border wall might not benefit from that kind of patent you know and so so that's what we're interested in like the in the how like in the methods that enabled that kind of construction and a lot of our work, I think, intentionally tries to avoid limiting the discussion of the border to the wall. Yes. We've definitely investigated, as we've been talking about, these kinds of um, technologies and, and protocols that, that continue to mineralize the physical border. But our work is primarily focused on trying to understand geographies that span the border, that, that limit the, mm -hmm. the impact mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. something as, as small and meaningless in the overall scheme of the binational territory as a line in the sand <laughs> or a line in the river or a wall that, um, that's dividing shared ecologies, shared airsheds, shared watersheds, things like this. Faster, cheaper, and better, or a critique of faster, cheaper, better seems to also carry in it an implicit critique of modernism. Mm. It almost sounds like an agenda for, for modernist thinking. Mm. Is this? Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about um, Mabel Wilson, Irene Chang, and Charles Davis's the latest book, Race and Modern Architecture. Mm -hmm that really tries to dismantle or rethinks the canon of modernism because it was constructed in relationship to 18th and 19th century modern science that invented racial hierarchies as a way to justify white supremacy in architecture. And so modernism, for me anyway, it's worth questioning the value system. So faster, better, cheaper also relates to very much um, colonial roots of progress, that in mm -hmm. the name of progress, mm -hmm. of right, it, it, if you normalize that kind of conversation, then, then you perhaps normalize colonizing and kind of um, the idea that we have to maybe not be faster or cheaper in order to care mm -hmm. uh, is kind of rendered obsolete, so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, that regime is still very much with us, you know, lean construction or, or whatever it is. Right versus the idea of, what would you say? I would say slower, lesser, fewer. Yeah. I mean, then we get back to just like adaptive reuse, right? Like a, the, the best way forward is to just take care of what we have. Slower I like a lot because then I think about like work hours in the construction industry that why not something, why, why shouldn't it take longer and therefore those people get paid more, you know? like. 
Yeah. Do you have a construction management program in the in your college school? Uh, in the main campus. On the main campus. Yeah, Is there a collaboration between architecture and construction? Uh, not that I know, no. Yeah, it's very difficult somehow in professional schools to, you know, this kind of a conversation should be happening across these two disciplines, shouldn't it? Absolutely, yeah. But I feel like construction management really, ne and most schools now are really nervous about catering towards the industry in terms of students being quote unquote job ready. And so if the industry is really CM not interested. CM programs don't worry about that as far as I know, yeah. nationally. They pride themselves on the 100% placements and so on. Oh, right, right, <laughs> right. Because, because they prepare, yeah. Because they're job ready. And you yeah. know, a lot of the research I read in CM I don't read, I mean, I, I'm talking titles of articles. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's very much still, at best, producing notions of efficiency via sustainable practices. Sure, sure, and managerial prowess. And managerial right, yeah. practices, yeah. And not so much the kind of, uh, so it would be, uh, I mean, I'm just hearing that as a sort of sidebar conversation. But Stephen, to you know, where you were trying to, I think, trying to take the conversation, perhaps thinking about the war and the binationality and the border condition is also a broader discussion about ideas of immigration and hostility to immigration or inverse immigration, which is what we were talking about earlier in terms of colon colonization is sort of dystopic immigration, right? Hmm. And, and, and war is also a kind of a dystopic immigration. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the cross-border movement it can be both interesting but also extremely destructive, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on who is doing it right. and what's mm -hmm. doing it. Which is in which context I found your discussion of these uh, war simulacrum cities. What, what do you call them? What's your technical term for these spaces? These, apparently there are like so many sites where they produce training how to do urban warfare in... It was not clear to me. Are they... Describe to me these sites and are they training people to do urban warfare? I suppose guerrilla kind of warfare. Cross borders internationally in Afghanistan, Iraq? Or are they sort of also training how to do warfare locally? It's a bit of both. So the name, I think, the catch-all name for the total collection of the sites would be Urban Operations Training Sites. Urban, um, urban Operations, urban operations is, a, is a military euphemism for, for urban warfare. Okay. And across the Urban Operations Training Sites, you have a very diverse set of typologies, some of which have been built on military bases for decades, if not the past century. Things like shoot houses, for instance, where infantry trainees, for instance, might learn how to clear a room or, you know, take a stairwell or take a hallway or something like this if there's some sort of insurgency that's occupying a single building. Mm -hmm. But over the last several decades in particular, since the September 11th attacks, the U.S. military has been investing in larger and larger scale brick and mortar sites that simulate more and more representative environments that the US military will likely encounter as they become more invested in counterinsurgency operations that are more often taking place in cities and in global cities exactly so there was also a shift historically these these environments have always sort of like paralleled the environments that the military is forecasting operations within so during the korean conflict we had korean villages during the vietnam war we had vietnamese villages and things like that built all over these sites since basically the turn of the 21st century these sites have uh, increasingly sort of in, in simulated aspects of middle eastern urban mm -hmm. environments mm -hmm. north african urban environments, and in general, just informal urban environments. So there's a, I guess, belief. I mean, belief. all the examples mm -hmm. you showed, it certainly seemed to me that each one of them had a mosque-ish character. Exactly. I mean, I didn't see any cities that were recognizably South Asian to me. I mean, mm -hmm. we have a significant Muslim population too, mm -hmm. but it seemed like very much kind of a production of a Middle Eastern anti-Muslim kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the mosque is, is actually a distinct and required feature in the, the particular typology <coughs> that we spend the most time sort of unpacking in the book called um, 
this is the gold standard of, of urban operations training environments, the combined arms collective training facility, which requires that there's a mosque, that there's a bank, that there's an embassy, that there's a dump, that there's a shanty town, things like this that are excerpted uh, as sort of the greatest hits of of global cities that we might expect the U.S. to oh, intervene with. greatest ever sort of stereotypical construction. I wonder, <coughs> you know, I wonder if you ever uh, saw the Laurie Anderson song. You know Laurie Anderson? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, she said she was once in an airport and they were producing warnings about terrorist crimes, so don't stand out as an American. And she said, okay, what does that mean? And they produced this list of mm-hmm, the things mm-hmm. you shouldn't do <laughs> in, a, in a foreign airport. And she's like, oh, that's just what it means to be an American. Mm. But inversely, I suppose, this list that you were just talking about, and the, the thing for me is, are these research distillations of actual urban fabrics, or are they sort of s- simulated productions of what they think these cities will be? A little bit of both. Some of the people who work on these bases that we've interviewed I've also mentioned that sometimes the military will send designers in the field, in the theater of war, to take notes and send recommendations back. So small details like the way in which the window covers are hinged at one of these villages, they uh, the mock villages, they had they had installed them in the opposite direction in which they're actually hinged to the window frame in the theater of war. So they had to change that because it reacts differently to different types of weapons. And so, so there are details and there's research that's being done during war that's coming back as intelligence in terms of what would make a space or a, a mock village or s- urban environment more realistic to where the theater of war will be. Um, mm-hmm. So there, uh, and there are architects that they hire to kind of design the, the gold standard of, of the sort of the context. Uh, at first they started with just like shipping containers laid out in the desert, but then they realized that that doesn't produce a realistic a reaction to to weaponry, but also to how military personnel and soldiers need to clear spaces. And so then they realize that they need to do more research. And so a lot of that intelligence from war comes back to rebuild these. It's familiar through different reports, for instance, of how the SEALs and and the strike team, for instance, trained for the Osama bin Laden raid, that Mm -hmm. like it is increasingly typical for like absolute precise replicas of environments to be sort of built on an as-needed basis for different Mm -hmm. operations Mm -hmm. but these environments I think to to our understanding they're they're tweaked in this way as as operations change to become more let's say site specific or culturally specific to the to the projected theater but in many ways they're sort of a lowest common denominator of expected generic architectural or urban forms just sort of fragments of forms that pose uh, what the military might consider the, the, the right kind of spatial challenge, right? That they're trying to produce a certain density or a certain blind spot or a certain um, I'm complexity. To compare this to like Christopher Alexander, pattern language, mm-hmm. you know? I mean I imagine it's a urban environment produced through a very specific filter, which is, you know, clear spaces. So maybe how doors mm-hmm. hinge, how mm-hmm. do they hinge in, do they hinge out? versus producing a urban environment as a typical urban environment. As a typical urban environment sounds like, you know, our old uh, urban morphology kind of studies. Mm-hmm. You know, we did a lot of these growing up in India, you mm-hmm. know, like, cause I grew up in a highly modernist city, mm-hmm. Chandigarh. Mm-hmm. And then we would study these uh, more traditional environments because it was the heydays of mo- postmodernism in the 80s and so on. Mm-hmm. So there was a big emphasis on sort of a producing and structuralism was big so you know how do you produce patterns Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of settlements and then how do you understand the pattern and then how do you use that to produce uh, new environments right you look at Doshi's work those Mm -hmm. things so any of these kind of uh, things but this is different it's sort of like that but it's different I'm trying to also get into your interest in this as architects Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things we, we try to unpack in the book is the this kind of parallel planning history through military planning that mm-hmm. coincides and diverges in significant ways from the 
planning histories and, and the morphology sort of studies that you mentioned that we know as architects and kind of urban designers. One of the things that the environments are trying to replicate is the peripheral urbanization that they see as a, an increasing sort of threat to, to operations. So peripheral? What do they mean by peripheral? Meaning they, they describe it as basically a sprawl, the, the, the sort okay. of the endlessness peri-urban. of the city. Yeah, peri-urban. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the military and, and military planners are, are cognizant of and skeptical of the, the kind of urban periphery as a particular challenge sure. because of its low, low density, but because of its, um, you know... That's a pre- higher challenge for them or a lesser challenge? It's challenging in different ways, I Just think. That, ways. Yeah, okay. that they... Part of, part of what these environments are trying to manage militaristically is combined arms, so the, the advance of ground troops, air power, and armor, or, or sort of tanks at the same time, right? Mm-hmm. If the operation is in a completely urbanized environment, the options for combined force are limited, so it's mostly like a mostly like an infantry operation or a special special forces operation. Mm -hmm. So these environments are really built in order to basically increase the the lethality of the delivery of multiple types of force in the types of environments that like the delivery of that force is possible. And in the types of environments that they're recognizing are more increasingly occupied strategically by non-state actors in okay, order to... Why learn. should we be interested in yeah. these architects, you know? A, it's of course a critique, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, it's uh, daylighting things that are going on mm-hmm. and, and critiquing them. But wh- what are you saying from all, through all of this? That here's another kind of architecture, a lot of us are involved in this and nobody really knows? Or is this a new kind of architectural imagination? Or, or can we learn about urbanism from this? Well, so one through line in the book is that it, it isn't just simulating urbanism, it is actually producing urbanism. So mm-hmm. the, there is evidence, for instance, that the military planning that has led to this interpretation of the city and the development of these simulated environments is now also the same military planning apparatus that's involved in nation building and infrastructure planning and urban planning. No, and really. So these are the same yeah, people. Exactly. So <laughs> so the <laughs> reductivist, as, as, you're, as you're describing the kind of reductivist yeah. nature of yeah. describing an urban environment sort of absent of the humanity of the urban environment and only in terms of weaponry. They consider themselves yeah. experts on the right. local urban condition. Oh, yeah. And, and their longest kind of, in terms of timescales, engagement in any theater of war is reconstruction after war. Yeah. And so that reconstruction is informed, right, by by the learnings and by the, the military objectives of any local condition. And so rebuilding based on these learnings is, is very real. And it's yeah, it's the same either DOD or private contractors that work for the DOD. So rebuilding is when a town has been sort of devastated right. by by warfare, then they gotta rebuild. Right. So those are the contractors and Absolutely, people involved. Yeah. But this is in, in in sites of war. They're not rebuilding. So this is not intelligence that's applied back back in the U.S. So there are moments where this kind of like warfare training has has happened in U.S. cities, mm-hmm. whether people know it or not. There are moments in Yeah, the I saw your map. You had, like, sites all over the country. All over the country. How many sites are there like this, nationally? In, in the U.S., do we know? Hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. Hundreds. But we, I mean, and that we know of. Um, and they're, but they're all, all like, hidden, of. covert, and they sort of uh, in military bases and outside, or are they in the middle of El Paso? Where are they? So Fort Bliss is, is an enormous... Um, presence in El Paso and, um, well, Texas and New Mexico. Playas is in New Mexico. And generally, if you submit a request, most people can visit these sites, mm. you know, um, and they, they coordinate which days you can visit, so what you can see and can't see. Why would people want to visit these sites unless they're crazy architects like you? Right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there are journalists, there's filmmakers, there's somebody oh, who right, made a right, film right, about right. this. So the training operations have happened during Black Lives Matter movements. 
in St. Louis, there was a, a moment where the military describes it as a coincidence that there was some kind of sort of um, military training just at the same time that a protest was scheduled. And that created a lot of sort of like uproar. And then the, I think the police and the military took that back and said, oh, it was just a coincidence. It didn't, it didn't mean anything that we were there. Mm. And so they're testing these kinds of events in, in urban environments in the US. But part of the thinking is that also there are architects and architecture firms that design cities post-disaster or that the Army Corps of Engineers rebuilds post-disaster. And so if the catalog of urban code is at their disposal in the way that they build it, then the part of the, the trajectory or the tangential thinking is that that also implicates the built environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, you know, because we had, uh, well, uh, during uh, the big Black Lives Matter, you know, we uh, in Seattle here, yeah. Uh, there were a lot of protests, and then there was this declaration of a independent uh, right uh, area. I don't know. Yeah, you remember yes, that? Yes, yes, uh, amazing. I forgot, and, and the name's escaping me right now. But the police station that was sort of ransacked during that movement, when we visited it soon after, was defended in a militaristic way. I mean, it seemed to me the infrastructure they very quickly deployed to defend that space had to have come from defending an embassy, yeah. like you pointed out yesterday, you know, defending an embassy is kind of central, right. uh, mm. uh, you know, queen piece in a chess game, you know, whatever, that, mm -hmm. that has to be defended for the king. Mm. But it seemed like they were deploying techniques which they presented as, you know, standard. Right. A police operating procedure, but seemed very much, much more than that. Yeah, yeah. Some of some of the sites we uncovered on the book talk about this con conflation of civilian policing, military training, and humanitarian aid training. That sometimes they train together in scenarios, and so there is a there is a learning and a shared of sharing of objectives. Um, that is driven by, it's within a military operation training, it's in a military base, and so that's part of, there's one chapter in the book where we talk about the promiscuity of these sites, that they're not just for military training, but that they're also seeping out and indoctrinating humanitarian aid response and police, domestic police response. Like the US, the NYPD has such a wide reach, and it's kind of, militaristic power even outside of the U.S. at airports that are deemed port of entry into the U.S. That kind of expansion is, is really troublesome. But also most of the equipment is, is military, is inherited by the military. That's the American program that I think President Obama was trying to combat to, to stop the flow of decommissioned military tanks and, and equipment and mm -hmm. weaponry that that usually is transferred to the police. Mm -hmm, I see. So that's part of, I think, like the defunding uh, ask, you know? Yeah. So, so to just sort of round out this part of our conversation, all these UOTS seem like they're directed towards, you know, our distant presences around the world. We are not uh, actively at war with Mexico in that sense. So does this work? How do these two things combine? How do you connect these two discussions of uh, binationality, immigration, border condition that you're living and I know you're interested in, and this sort of uh, what's uh, uh, work? Is there any connection or? I think one of the shared interests is the the kind of understanding of the primacy of the city as a political actor mm -hmm. that might not coincide with sovereignty of individual nations. Mm -hmm. So like having, living in the binational uh, context of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, I think we see that firsthand that there is a, a kind of constituency of the region that has a sort of political import that, that is in many ways independent of the multiple jurisdictions that nominally control the site, right? The kind of remoteness of the city relative to the state capital in Austin or the, the national capital in the federal district in Mexico and things like that sort of lend towards this um, city as autonomous political agent. And I think in our context that's rather 
productive in many ways, and, and, and there's some optimism there. In a military context, this is something that military theorists actually kind of fear and plan to be able to control, the, the kind of, I think we describe it as a pointillistic assemblage of, of sort of city-states, as how military theorists are projecting the kind of state of geopolitics in the near future as national governance and, and sort of sovereignty gets problematized by non-state actors occupying specific sites or specific cities and managing them in ways that might be counter to state interests or, mm -hmm. or against extra state interests or national or global security, for instance. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah, there's, I, I guess, basically a kind of primacy of the urban as having a kind of political agency that, that doesn't necessarily respect political boundaries. So one of the things I've noticed about your book and your talk is, you know, you have a very high facility in descriptive technology. Hmm. Amazing, interesting words. Even just now you were talking about pointless something, something. And of course you have beautiful, um, fabulous graphics to go with this. So uh, talk to me a little bit about this. It seems to me you invest very deeply precise and uh, imaginative descriptions of things rather than inversely keeping it plain speak, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, we're always surprised when, when people talk about our, our graphic sensibility because... And also literary sensibility. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, think it, I think we are surprised when we're perceived in that way because our drawings and our maps in a, in a very tangential way are, are, those are our way of taking data or information that is not necessarily visible and kind of finding a precision with the drawing tools and therefore it's a, it's a document rather than a processed drawing. You know, so we don't we don't post-produce any of our drawings. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, uh, they never make it to, let's say, Illustrator or InDesign. It's really straight out of the software that was the tool of the research. And so, so many times we lament that we don't have time to kind of like, you know, we saw, you have Perry Culper here, like we don't have time to go back and like layer and and craft a beautiful drawing. And so I'm always surprised when people say like your, your, your drawings and your work is, is really informational because it's it's not processed at all it's just it's just the tool so many times we use different software and we teach ourselves in relationship to the specific task at hand that we are curious about but also because the topic is so serious that we feel uh, we owe it to ourselves and to our audience to be as precise as possible and to really sort of in a in a kind of matter-of-fact way produce the the visual representation of what the, the topic is as faithfully as possible without sort of like the added layers of, of um, yeah, post-production processing. A lot of investment in faithfulness and documentation and precision. Yeah, like I, I think we're like documentary folks rather than architect, you know, like in this kind of research. It's like a documentary, I think, the book too versus interpretive, hermeneutic, conceptual. Why right, is, because... Why, why that? Why that investment? And also in data and computers, as architects. Yeah, well, so as architects, we're trained in those tools, but also it feels, because the, because the topic is so serious and we're really, with a book, we're trying to provide the kind of the additional architectural and urban history that needs to be taken into account in a relation in addition to like what is taught in schools traditionally it feels that it should not be interpretive because we have certain biases that it that it that it would be taken more seriously and the topic is so serious that it earns a certain kind of honesty of, of um, findings mm -hmm. I think right do, do you share that do you yeah I I it's a very interesting turn of phrase again. Earns an honesty of finding. Sounds very <laughs> modernist in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Stephen. I, th I think maybe just a minor contribution to this. Um, 
I think one way to think about it is that the the drawings and the the representations are meant to make something invisible visible, and so the design of the drawing at the end of the day is not as important as the design of the process to make the drawing, mm. or the design of the let's say the workflow or the the method of gathering or the method of investigation that that sort of enables us to make the drawing. I think that's that's where we as designers design. Yeah, <laughs> like we sure. design our method more than our output. Mm -hmm. right. um, yeah. yeah. So uh, different from you know Tufty or somebody that's sure. trying to take a certain amount of information and and sort of produce it into a graphic that is focused towards uh, apprehension. Yours is more sort of a design of a certain process and then production of uh, information, which I feel to a certain extent, and you can disagree with me, has a level of defamiliarity, which I think is appropriate to the things that you're looking at, which are sort of strange and defamiliar, right? You're not trying to produce the readings of the placeness of place, right, mm. uh, or, or mm -hmm. phenomenology, or, or th you know, those kind of mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. You're trying to underscore and point out strangenesses to a certain extent, yeah. uh, and their strangeness, yeah. and therefore the graphics. That sounds great. That sounds yeah. great. <laughs> 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 Which is an interesting sort of concept also then to apply to you know, the other topic I think that you are quite interested in, which, you know, I would describe as the climate emergency, or sort of the issues of how to tabulate, document, honest, what was your phrase, honestly, oh, the honesty of mm. climate yeah. being into, into, uh, into what I suppose you would call architecture of representation. H how do you move from war and borders and immigration to climate because it's a transnational issue is that sort of it's an entangled issue the sort of climate change has been declared as part of nas a national security concern mm -hmm. for obvious reasons like a resource depletion countries will start fighting for gas and water, but also because climate change is producing an unprecedented wave of climate migration as well. Mm -hmm. And so they are part of sort of a national security focus. And, and for us, that means, that means understanding the tools of, of climate measuring, climate control, climate extraction, and understanding their legacy that they come from, from military inventions. So uh, you've probably seen this, that the U.S. And the, and the Chinese military are capable of producing snow and rain and weather. And oh, really? So, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, you could uh, rain... Uh, I mean, like they make snow on my ski slope. You're not talking about the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the same technology, but like cloud bombing and cloud seeding and, and yeah, rain yeah. seeding, um, it's very much a military technology to gain advantage mm. in the battlefield. Um, and so for us being on the on the Chihuahua Desert where we are and understanding that that Fort Bliss like the, the military outfit in the region is directly also looking at issues of climate change and then how that kind of trans translates to the sharing of the water of the Rio Grande that both American and Mexican farms have certain deals of how many gallons of water one can take a day and that all of that infrastructure is controlled by the binational dam and the dam at Elephant Butte uh, up north. These are all sort of like military technologies that are at the service of mitigating climate change between nations as, as national policy. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about like whether or not we recycle in El Paso, it's really like how like legacies of binational policy will continue to impact that region. And, and really, w we have a 50-year expiration date in terms of water resources in El Paso, but there's a scholar, Joe Heyman at, at UT El Paso, who says, actually, it'll be more that water will still be available, but it'll be expensive, and therefore it's a poverty issue, mm. that it's an access issue, not necessarily scarcity. I get a sense in the sort of graphics 
you presented and the data you collected, that you're having some kind of a discussion between data at a local scale and data at a general or whatever universal, national, global scale. Yeah. And even in terms of technology, you use uh, Arduino sensors Sometimes, and so yeah. on, rather than whatever satellites. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. What, what's that about? What, what, what are you get, What are you trying to get at? So the, the so the satellite technology or the air quality monitoring stations that are nationally supported and run average data over regions and there seems to be a kind of a scarcity of measurement around the U.S.-Mexico border for civilian use. And so what we recognized is that at a hyper-local block by block... Scarcity of measurement data is not available? They don't make it available or they don't care about that? Uh, it's, there is the kind of the, the air monitoring surveillance system for national security that, that does its own work and it's unknown to us. It's completely top secret. But then the air quality monitoring monitoring stations. What well, my iPhone has my air quality. What, what do you mean by that? There is something separate from. Yes, uh, there's the national bio watch that um, Stephen described yesterday. That do you know? Yeah, well, like what we're trying to do with the with the sensing and and with the as you said the the way that the work focuses on a hyper-local scale in conversation with or, or as a kind of counterpoint to the regional or the national data is that there are incredible blind spots at fine scales, uh, fine spatial scales or fine temporal scales that actually leave very many communities disadvantaged, like under-informed and uh, without the data that they would need to like leverage to, to enact any sort of like transformative change. So mm. like throughout, I think throughout the, the shade project, the air project and, and other, other projects that we're interested in, we're interested in the, 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 the ways in which urban environments are managed through data collection at a kind of broad scale, mm -hmm. but how that competes with the reality that produces conditions of, of spatial and environmental injustice at a much finer scale. So the regional quality could be A-OK -okay for the day, but if I live on a certain block with, you know, with an unpaved street, or if I live, Gosh. you know, downwind from the recycling plant, or, or across from the idling truck traffic and things like this, it's a completely different experience and it gets, it gets smoothed over by regional reporting or national reporting or sort of global reporting of, of these embassies. So like so specific communities that are around border crossings where trucks idle for hours, mm -hmm. break dust and that kind of exhaust mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. is directly impacting kids respiratory health in those neighborhoods sure. that coincide with the highest rate of uh, Spanish-speaking kids and the lowest, some of the lowest incomes in the nation. And so when you start to correlate the two, the, the sort of air quality monitoring doesn't necessarily reflect, even from Google aerial views, the truck traffic lines, because that's a time coding of, of, of air pollution that's just not visible when you just look at the built environment. So you're talking about the grain of the data, how mm. fine grain it is. You say it never gets fine grained enough. Right, because they don't have that data, or they don't purpose, because they don't share that data, or they don't care for that data. Because th there isn't that data, there isn't that kind there of measurement. But the the BioWatch surveillance system, for national security purposes, has samples of air every day that crosses the border to measure for airborne kinds of terrorism. Against, okay, you know, just across the so there right. The so border. there is that kind of like precise measurement, but then there isn't. The kind of the just as a defensive thing, right, just right. because somebody is trying yeah. to send over a bio weapon right, or right, something. Right. I see. And, but, and you're suggesting that that technology can be used to produce extremely localized micro data. Right. If, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting argument because generally when we talk about data and climate, the it's the reverse, which is to say, oh, no place is local because everything affects everything else. Right. Right? Yeah. It doesn't really matter, you know, where you are because what they're doing down south is going to affect what's happening up here and, you know, fires in California, but we have red suns and so on and so forth. But you are sort of, in a sense, saying 
it's also the inverse that the micro scale that really matters. Right. So where do you take that? I mean, because to a certain extent, I'm starting to think it's like for traffic they have that level of micro data, right? My iPhone can predict I'm going to slow down in 20 minutes. Right, right. <laughs> right? Because they have that. You know, you, for, for seven minutes, you'll be slowed down. I'm like, right. oh, wow. And yeah, it is seven minutes. It's insane. Right. Because they're collecting data all the time from micro sources from every driver. Right. But we generally critique that because it's surveillance society. Right. Right. So it's not like, I mean, we could collect that, at, you know, they want to collect that at health now, right? They, right, they want right. to know everything that's coming on, on the sensors on my iPhone mm. and, you know, they mm. want to know every heartbeat I have and, you know, load it up into the cloud and predict which medicine I'm going to need in five years uh, as I get older, right? I mean, yeah, and predict your insurance rates, yeah. And predict my insurance rates. So this is a, this is all this sort of dystopic imagination about all yeah. of this. But I'm trying to read your sort of investment <laughs> in this very particular yeah. data and, and how, in a sense, it reverses that. I mean, your work is designed to, uh, I suppose one would say it inversely also, could be empowering. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, it goes back to the conversation yesterday from the lecture prompted by a question that, um, which, what, the part that I enjoy about our data is that it's not scientifically accurate and it can't really be used as factual measurements. Why um, do you enjoy that? Because for this reason, because it, it's not really meant to produce a surveillance state mm -hmm. that requires accuracy. It's really meant to, be, to instigate conversations and to allow us, us to draw these issues um, in ways that can sort of start to collect communities and local jurisdictional kind of fragmentation around shared issues is to say that look mm. at the shared air that these three neighborhoods continue to breathe maybe three three neighborhoods need to come together um, and to kind of rally for sort of like local infrastructural investment and so um, because there was there an activist group that wanted to use our dust data but they can't be used in, in a court of law or anything like that because they're not produced from a certain really expensive high-end sensor. Mm -hmm. They're really meant to describe volume because these are $50 sensors that we made, you know? And so, right. so um, I like the idea that, that we're not um, like hyper-focused experts in any one of the technologies that produces the data, but that we have the ability and the agility to find these gaps in the, in the like precision of the measurements so mm -hmm. that they stay at the at the role of activism rather than in the role of control. Um, mm -hmm. would I, is that fair? So it's interesting. So here you are reversing your earlier <laughs> emphasis. On right, the honesty of the drawing. Yeah. You're saying, no, it's actually the approximation and inaccuracy that's, that's important. Right. <laughs> uh, because it's not really the data, it's its ability to see communities together. Right. That's right. important. So you're sort of, it's a different register. Yeah, like that, the accuracy is in the, in the documenting of, of sort of like military control, and then the inaccuracy is in the work we do in reaction to that. That's an amazing, amazing place to summarize and move, and maybe move towards the end of our conversation here. It's like you traffic both inaccuracy and inaccuracy <laughs> as technologies of, I would say, architectural thinking. Mm. So, so, so moving towards the, uh, you know, towards the end of our conversation here. So, w what's the motivation behind all this work, uh, behind your lab and uh, and all this? Is it, this is politics? Where are you? Where are you? What are you trying to do with all of this? Most architects are trying to win big projects. What are you guys trying to do with all? Of oh yeah, we'll never win a big project. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I well, so for me, um, so I grew up in communist dictatorship, uh, Albania. in Albania, yeah. in a politically persecuted family. My father was sent to political prison, and so what that meant is that we were under constant surveillance and control by the dictatorship. 
Um, and so for me, access to education, access to public space, access to food rations was always directly related to where we were um, classified as a family in, in military terms. Mm -hmm. And then I was a refugee in Greece for three and a half, uh, almost four years. Mm -hmm. Also evading. How old were you when um, you were a refugee? Um, from 12 to 16. Okay. Uh, so a teenager, mm -hmm. uh, and not speaking Albanian with my brother in Greece, speaking only Greek so that we wouldn't get caught, and my brother was still caught and deported back to Albania. And so there's always been this kind of um, how the way I think about the built environment and space and access to rights is always in relationship to um, being chased by some kind of military power. And so even though here many years later um, I feel that that's that's the work that I want to be doing um, and it doesn't thank you for listening to architecture talk this is your producer Mary Lee we hope you enjoyed the conversation and if you did please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify we would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk. Um, delighted, yeah. That's yeah. It. And then people can choose what to do with it. Steven, what about you? So I, I think the, the work as it hits the ground in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez over the last, I guess we've been there seven years and looking maybe seven years in the future. Um, we're excited about taking the work, the methods, the research, the findings, the visualizations, and the, the kind of test projects and helping that community and communities like it that share similar challenges, transborder communities, communities that are, that are faced with, with climate emergencies, etc to help them develop both awareness of their situation, to have sort of em em empowered agency within, within their situation, and, and hopefully produce long-term impact. And I think we're encouraged in, in our particular context now, um, having sort of been embedded, <laughs> I guess, or, or uh, having the work in part um, sort of realized for the last several years in, in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. We're encouraged about sort of what the what the next series of hopefully impactful projects might be, engaging with with not only local communities but also local governance to, to hope no, no, to what, transform. What about biography? You did. Yeah. You, she went straight down biography. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't have that story. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have that story, but there must be some biography. I mean, why are you invested in this? I think I've always recognized conditions of, of spatial and social injustice and wanted to make a difference within them. I grew up actually in St. Louis, um, Missouri, which is, a, which is an incredible, incredible city, but also an incredibly um, divided city that, yeah, that faces sure. um, a lot of challenges, not only between um, sort of the community in St. Louis, Missouri, and East St. Louis, Illinois, mm -hmm. is, is a sort of geographic border that historically has, has um, divided you know, social and economic and, and kind of racial communities. Um, within the city, there's, there's a sort of north-south divide, there's neighborhood yeah. divides, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and just seeing, seeing how, that, how those sorts of divisions played out in the capacity of the city to, to advance, the capacity of its citizens to sort of understand and engage and move forward together um, has, has been a part of me, and I think um, I think that's that's part of why I got um, interested in uh, designing for the the built environment. Sort of recognizing that that the built environment um, and the design of it is dependent on, on you know the the various sort of fragmentations that it is sort of systemically composed of, <laughs> um, and if we can engage those those divisions as as a as a goal in, in sort of what we bring to the, to the planning efforts or the, the sort of design efforts or the mm -hmm. design of information efforts. I think that that's always sort of been a part of what, what I've wanted to do. Estela and Stephen, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you for it. It's been so great. Our pleasure. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Mary Lee. We hope you enjoyed the conversation, and if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.